This YouTube series will cover material that we cover in our Introduction to Astronomy class from a meteorite found in Antarctica from the planet Mars and the search for life, all the way through to supernovas and black holes. So we will spend a little bit of time talking about some of the other players involved. The first person we should discuss then, beyond Galileo, is a guy by the name of Johannes Kepler. They are contemporaries, though they never meet. They're aware of each other's work, and Kepler too is an astronomer. Although he really doesn't make use of a telescope like Galileo did. Many of Galileo's observations are done with this new instrument, the spyglass or the telescope that we've discussed. Instead, Kepler is sort of an old school astronomer. He is, like Copernicus, very aware of the motion of objects in the sky. He's an avowed heliocentrist as well. But what he finds is a way to make an improvement on the Copernican model. In the Copernican model, Copernicus has maintained this old idea that things always move in circles. Kepler says, I think the sun's at the center, but I think something else is going on here. Kepler, in fact, is uh, first rule of thumb, if you will, Kepler's first law, as it's called, discusses the motion of planets around the sun. Now that motion, again, in the Copernican model, was circles. Kepler says, I can do a little bit better than that. From my observations, I recognize, I recognize that planets move, planets move in ellipses. with the sun at one focus. And we have to stop for a minute because there's some terminology here that we've discussed. What is an ellipse? An ellipse is essentially a circle with two centers. Each of those centers is labeled as a focus. In fact, a circle is simply a, a, a special form of an ellipse. It's where both of the foci, both of the focuses, are at the same spot. So a circle is a special form of an ellipse. So in fact, what he's saying is, look, planets move in ellipses. So if we were to draw an ellipse, we'll put a center here, put a center there. This is the planet's orbit around the sun. And he says planets move in ellipses, and the sun sits at one of the foci. So here's the sun. So what he's saying is, planets move in elliptical orbits. And, you might ask yourself, well, what sits at the other center? The answer is, as we discussed in class, everything and nothing. What do we mean by that? We mean that it is the combined gravitational pull of all the other things in the solar system. The planet Jupiter being one of the biggest pulls. Saturn, Venus, Mercury. The center of the galaxy plays a role, pulling us out of round in our orbit, if this were the Earth orbiting the Sun in an ellipse. So, there is everything's combined gravitational pull that adds up to create this ellipse, but there is nothing that sits specifically there in the other focus. So, Kepler's first law says, look, planets move in ellipses, and they orbit the Sun. Now notice when I added that description, I said to you, it's the combined gravitational force of everything else. You say, well, why didn't Kepler write that? He didn't, because Newton hadn't been around yet. Remember, Kepler is around around the same time as Galileo. He's born a little bit later than Galileo. He passes away a little bit before Galileo dies. So Kepler and Galileo are contemporaries. It would take a guy by the name of Newton in 1687 to clarify the why and the how that this was going on. But for an empiricist like Kepler, he understood that planets move in ellipses with the sun at one focus. And he went one step further. He knew that as he watched the planets orbit the sun, they didn't always move in the same pace as they went around the sky. Kepler's second law states, equal areas, equal times. What does he mean? Equal areas, equal times. If we took a planet like the Earth that was orbiting the Sun and we carve out a certain amount of area. Let's move the Earth from point A to point B and that carves out a certain amount of area. 
Now let's move the earth from point C to point D. Same thing. If you can convince yourself that these two areas are equal, what he said is, it takes the same amount of time for a planet to carve A to B as it does from C to D. Of course, what was he really saying? What was he really saying is that this takes one month, and this takes one month. In order for a planet to carve out a larger portion of that, when it's closer to the sun, it's got to be moving faster. So Kepler's second law basically states that as we move around in ellipses, planets move much faster when they're close to the sun and much slower when they're further away. The more elliptical the orbit, the more extreme this variation. Of course, you and I look at that and say, sure, of course, it's because of gravity, the gravitational pull of the sun. But Kepler didn't have access to that information. That wouldn't be until 1687 when Newton's laws come around. So in Kepler, we have a clarification, an enhancement of the heliocentric model, which is good. You want to see that in any theory. You have a recognition that planets don't move in circles, they move in ellipses, and that they move faster when they're closer and slower when they're further away. He then went on to make a relationship between the period of a planet's orbit and its average distance. Uh, we didn't discuss that formally in class, but you can see very clearly that the closer a planet is to the sun in average distance, the faster it goes around, and the longer the time it takes to go around the sun, the further out it is. That's Kepler's contribution. Now let's talk a little bit about what Isaac Newton had to say.